think the, the big question that everyone has having encountered your stuff for the first time is how do you go from monk to storyteller online and in such a big way? Because it, it really is a dichotomy between two worlds. And I know that when we think of monks, we don't think of them on social media. We don't think of them, you know, being out there in the public. Absolutely. So I always had this desire to spread wisdom. When I became a monk and got this incredible opportunity to study texts and books that were 5,000 years old, all I could think about was like, how do I make sense of this to someone who has no idea what this is? Being born and raised in London, I was just like, how does this connect to that 18 year old kid in London that I used to be? How does this connect to that girl who's getting bullied at college? How does this connect to that guy who hates his job? How does this connect to anyone? And so for me, I was always reading all of these incredible texts, 5,000 years old and going, how do I make that relevant, accessible and practical to everyone? Because I was seeing huge benefits in my personal life from living those principles, but I knew not everyone was gonna like run off to a mountain and become a monk and, and live the lifestyle I'd chosen, but I felt I wanted them to experience that. So what I did was beyond, I mean, this is a fast forward version, but I started sharing content online very late. I joined social media in 2014 and in 2016 launched my first video. Before then, I'd been creating content and speaking at universities and schools and companies for a long, long time. So I'd been testing what resonated with people, what connected with them. And then I just decided, I was like, I want this to reach anyone who has a mobile phone. And I read a study that said more people own a mobile phone than a toothbrush. So I was like, <laughs> If that's the truth, then we need to get it out to everyone. And I thought, what better way than video? So I remember uploading my first video, 3rd Jan 2016 on YouTube, and I had no idea where it would go or how it would do. I think it did okay, and it started off really well. And then I realized it was only doing well because I kept refreshing YouTube <laughs> and the views kept going up. That doesn't work anymore, by the way. And I just wanted to spread wisdom at the pace people want entertainment. I wanted to make wisdom entertaining. I wanted it to be engaging. And I wanted to feel like you were watching television or watching a movie. It didn't need to feel like a class. And so I started out and thankfully, Ariana Huffington, within three months, someone showed her my video at Davos at the, at the conference and her team reached out and they said, we'd love for you to create a series of videos for HuffPost. We're not gonna pay you anything, but we'd love to test it out. So I made four videos for HuffPost. Those four videos did 100 million views. It was the most amount of views they'd ever had. And that overnight kind of had a big effect on my trajectory. And that actually was the smaller end. 2017, I really started focusing on my own content on my own channels and platforms. And things have just been insane since then. But the focus has always been, how do you make this entertaining? How do you make it practical? How do you make it accessible? And how do you make it actionable so that people can actually live it today? And I feel like most people listening to this have encountered your content and it's just different. It just feels different than the other content that's spread throughout social. And the storytelling angle is a big part of that. Were you always a storyteller growing up or is that something that the solitude of being a monk sort of drew out of you? That's a great question. I was, and I still am, a, a big introvert at heart. And as a kid, I was like the shyest kid in school. I was okay at English. I loved spoken word growing up. So I'm a huge Eminem fan. And I spent my teens listening to Eminem. I think I fell in love with English because of Eminem. Like being able to bend words, being able to like research in the thesaurus, like synonyms to words, or like looking at a dictionary for deeper definitions of words so that you could make them rhyme or mean something else. So I got fascinated with spoken word when I was around 14. And I love playing around with words and language. So I think that became a big part of my life in my teens. And then when I became a monk, so much of how we were taught were through stories like st ancient stories, timeless stories, wisdom stories, like all the learning of the world has always been story. And so because I was listening to incredible storytellers, it was so wonderful to like absorb that atmosphere. So I can't take all the credit for it. It was just because I was learning with monks who were just incredible storytellers. And my job was to tell those stories, but make them relevant. So I don't think I was always a storyteller. I think it's something that came from immersing myself in being a monk in that community. And then it was something where I've just spent so much time with people's pain. And I think that's often missed. Like over the last 13 years, I've coached several people, thousands of people, worked with people, one-on-one -on -one groups. And when you sit with people's pain, you figure out how to break through that pain and connect with people. 
And you realize more often than not, it's a story. And that story, when it's real and it's genuine, that breaks through everything. So for me, that's, that's where it evolved. It wasn't something I was naturally gifted at or had a skill in or any of that sort. Well, it's certainly a thing that's been coming up in our conversations over and over again with the emotional component to the human spirit. And that's going to be wrapped in stories. And we tell ourselves stories to make sense of the world. Uh, we're putting stories together constantly to figure out how to, to get through things. Kobe here was just here with us talking about his new venture in storytelling to be able to give wisdom to young men. And <clears throat> it's a it's a wonderful thing because, of course, a lot of these things, as you mentioned, some of these parables, some of these lessons are thousands of years old. And we might hear them in contemporary form, but to us in that form, they just sound like a fuddy-duddy cliche and we throw it out the window. Without that story, uh, how can we put any sort of uh, emotional teeth into it and feel good about it. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. When we think about connecting with one another, we do it through stories. And when we meet each other for the first time, we're sharing stories. We heard your story of moving to LA, even in the green room here. And obviously you've studied some of the best stories in the world, passed down thousands of years. What have you drawn from those stories that you try your best to encapsulate in the videos that you create? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I, I'm going to tell a story to answer that question. Great. It's not even that old and I'm not even sure how completely factual it is, but it's so powerful that I'm going to share it anyway. The story is a claim to Alexander the Great. It could be anyone. And I would, if, if that's not true, then I would just listen in and think of any great warrior or any great emperor or someone who achieved a lot in life. And so the story is of when he's on his deathbed. And when he's on his deathbed, it's said that he had three wishes. And those three wishes, when his ministers asked him what he wanted, was that he wanted him to be carried by all the doctors to his funeral. So he wanted his coffin and his body inside the coffin to be carried by all the doctors, the best doctors, to his funeral. The second thing is he wanted that path to be laid with everything that he'd gained in life, all the jewels, all the riches, all the money, everything. And the third thing he wanted was that he wanted his coffin to be left open so that you could see his hands on either side, right? And the ministers looked at him and said, that is the most morbid thing in the world. Like, this is your last wish and those are your three wishes. And they said, why are they your three wishes? And Alexander the Great explained, he said that I want the best doctors in the world to carry my body because I want the world to see that even the best doctors in the world can't save you from death. He said, I want the path to my funeral to be laid with everything I've gained to show people that you can't take anything with you. And he said, I want my hands to be outside of the coffin to show that we come into this world empty handed and we leave this world empty handed. And that's one of my favorite stories and what I try and imbibe in my videos and live by is that I believe that we all have a finite number of breaths and we all get an opportunity to make them count. And there's a beautiful thought by Maya Angelou where she said, people will forget what you did, people will forget what you said, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And for me, that's what we've got. All of us have this limited amount of time and all that's gonna be remembered is how we made people feel. And so for me, my videos are all about how am I making people feel? If I can give people a feel of self-worth, a sense of personal growth, a sense of confidence, a sense of self-esteem, whatever it may be, I wanna use my living time doing that. And what I love about this entire idea of, of sharing these stories is the realness tied to them, right? The stories that you're sharing, they resonate because the emotions are real. They're not saccharine, they're not fake, that you see on social media, which is you know this alternate reality almost that people try to put their best foot forward. And, and your stories speak to the realness of emotion and the pain that we all feel as humans, no matter where we are in life. With obviously choosing the solitude to become a monk, how does one leave it's sort of obviously a, a beautiful place with amazing friends and family to just go and seek that knowledge? How do you end up making that decision, especially at a young age? I think the big thing is we all are looking for role models when we're growing up. Like, I feel like we all had someone we looked up to. And I was just fortunate and I have to, I have to owe it to fortune and, and grace that I was so fortunate that when I was 18, one of my role models became a monk because my role models were celebrities, CEOs, entrepreneurs, incredible people who are achieving a lot in the world. 
But when I met him, I got to meet someone who was truly happy. And I think we meet a lot of people who have a lot of money, who have a lot of success at a young age, but you rarely meet someone who's truly happy. And I think everyone who's listening right now will, or watching will be able to remember a time when they felt they met someone who is happy. And I'm sure that's a rare memory, but it exists. And I was so captivated by that happiness that I felt this person was experiencing that I was like, I want that, you know? And you feel that, like, I always say that it's always the common denominator in the room. If you're in a room with someone who has millions of followers, you'll be like, oh, I want that. And if you're in the room with someone who has a yacht, you'll be like, oh, I want a yacht. And if someone lives in a fancy home, you'll be like, oh, I want a fancy home. Like we always want what we feel in the room. Like the person who has the most in the room becomes the most desirable. But for me, I was so fortunate to be in a room where someone was happy and that became the most desirable thing. And I was just seeing around me, I was aware that I was looking at people around me who had money, but were sad, who had the love of everyone in the like relationships, whatever, like the best looking partners, whatever. And they still were sad. And I was just looking around me at 18 and observing that I couldn't meet someone who's really happy apart from this guy. And so I was like, I want that. So I ended up spending all my summer holidays from 18, aged 18 to 22, half of them in bars, steakhouses, and working in the world of finance in London, and the other half living as a monk in India. So I call it my first ever split test or my AB test, where I was literally like, I'm gonna live the paradox. Like I'm gonna go from living up large, like, you know, having fun, having the best relationships, drinking, going out, whatever it is, and I'm gonna compare that to the opposite. And I can totally say by doing that experiment four years later, I was convinced that the experiment of living as a monk was more meaningful, more purposeful, and made me more happy. So I was like, it's, it's a no brainer. So that's how at an early age, it was just an experiment. And that's why my consistent recommendation to anyone listening is experiment with stuff, like try stuff out, go and live it for a week, live it for a weekend. Don't just think about it in your head. Like get out of your head and get into action. So if I just thought about it, I probably wouldn't have done it. But getting to experiment with it taught me so much. Do you remember what it was that you had seen from that person that, that you hadn't seen from all these other successful people around you that was clear to you that that was happiness or that what he had was different than these other folks? Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing was that he didn't try and justify his success to anyone. <laughs> so like he didn't walk into the room and say, oh, by the, and, and I found out afterwards, he'd given up jobs at Google and Microsoft to be a monk, but he never said that. Yeah. And, and he just came in and he was just totally himself. And I felt that from him. It was an energy. It was like, he was totally himself. And bear in mind, I wasn't spiritual or religious. So there wasn't a natural inclination towards him. And he was totally happy being himself. He was dressed in robes, but at no point did he look uncomfortable to be where he was. And bear in mind, we were all young 18 year olds who do not get impressed by someone in robes. So there was no external facet of him that was attractive or anything like that. And the third thing was that I felt that he genuinely meant what he was saying. And I think that's the hardest bit. It's like, we all know, we've all played roles where you have to become someone because you're wearing a certain suit or role or title. Whereas when he spoke, I was just like, yeah, that's what he thinks. Like, that's what he believes. That's, he's genuinely living that. And then when I got to see him in action, you could see he just loved every moment. And the way he dealt with every person was so gracious and so kind and so loving and so connected. And I was like, let's see if he can do that in India. Like there was a part of me that was still skeptical. And then when I saw him in India, it was exactly the same. And I was like, oh, wow. And now I've known him for such a long time that you see someone in multiple scenarios, whether they're in front of a crowd or on their own and they're the same, mm -hmm. that's hard, right? Like when someone can stay the same, whether they're with a million people or whether they're with one person, that's, you know, that wins your respect. It's that authenticity, yeah. right? And I feel it's easy to lose sight of that when you're collecting all of these things that make us appear make us appear successful now we would be remiss this month to not talk about toxic relationships and i would imagine at your age on that career path saying you know what i'm gonna go be a monk in india uh you dealt with some doubt and you dealt with some people who were like absolutely not and even to this day i'm sure you're dealing with those doubters so take us back to that moment when you are carving out a new path for yourself when everyone else is probably thinking you're leaving everything on the table behind for this one thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. I tell this story on my podcast about how I was first greeted by everyone around me just going, you've gone mad. 
Like literally like all my friends at university were just like, you've gone crazy, right? And the second thing was, are you gay? Like that was the, those are the <laughs> two questions that I was asked. And, and this is what, this is 2010 when I made the decision. So nine years ago, and people were just like, yeah, so you're mad, you've gone crazy, you've been brainwashed, you're gay, or, you know, like what's, and everyone's quite confused because they saw me as someone who was normal in, in every other sense. And, and I was like, yeah, I'm the same guy. I've just decided to graduate and become a monk instead of going to work for X bank or X tech company. And so what I realized was I was so sure of what I wanted to do that I wasn't gonna let people's opinions break me down. And even though it was uncomfortable in the beginning, I'd built up such a brilliant other side of the bridge where I'd built up great relationships with monks. I'd built up a great practice over the four years. I'd built the other side of the bridge. And that's where I feel toxic relationships are hard to leave when you haven't visioned the bridge of where you wanna cross. And if you haven't built the other side, you're scared of putting that first step on the bridge. So for me, I just built a solid other side of the bridge where leaving that toxicity wasn't hard. But if I hadn't, then it would have been super tough and it would have brought me down. But for me, it was like just detaching from those opinions that other people had around me. Now, obviously, coming out the other side, being on the other side of the bridge and, and now being celebrated, how have you dealt with those people who you identified as toxic but now want back into this amazing life you've built, right? They doubted you originally. They said, this is not gonna work. You proved them wrong. Now they want a part of you. Yeah, and, and I think a big part of me when, when people have doubted me is I've genuinely tried to take out the feeling of I'm going to prove them wrong. And so every time I feel like someone is against me or I feel like some animosity or negativity from someone, I remove the thought in my head that says I've got to show them because I don't want that to become my motivation because if that becomes my motivation and intention, then now that person controls me. Right, and now external. if they're not impressed when I come out the other side, then I'm gonna keep seeking their validation. So I think that's a big thing we do in toxic relationships where we pin our happiness onto how that person feels about us, good or bad, and then you're left your whole life searching for that. But going back specifically to the question you asked around, around how, how I would do that, my big focus was how can you just want to connect with people as people. Now, the people that stuck with me the whole way, I trust them and love them more than anyone. People who left and come back, I don't trust them. And I'm okay with that. I have my distance because I'm just like, there's a, if you weren't with me at that time, then I can't trust you in the same way as I trust these people who've always been there. So in the best thing is it's shown me my true friends. And therefore I have a great group of people around me that love me, that have always been there, that have, even if they misunderstood me, they were honest enough to say, yeah, I don't get you, but I'm gonna stick around. And I love that honesty too, right? It's not like everyone who stayed around was like, Jay, you're amazing. You're making the best right. decision of your life. They were just like, I don't <laughs> get you. You're weird, but I'm gonna stick around because there's something here. And, and then the other side of it is, I feel like we give, we give our toxic relationships and negativity so much energy. We're like, const like, for example, in your comment section on Instagram for anyone who's on social <laughs> media, for everyone who's on social media, you could pinpoint the one negative comment out of a hundred positive comments. And we all do it. We amplify the negative and you see it all the time. And we do the same in our lives where we sit here talking about all the toxicity. And so for me, it's like, I can either spend all my energy trying to convince that one person to love me, or I can reply to the people that love me already and they'll love me more because they already engage with me and they're gonna feel so happy that I responded to them. And I think this is a, a great simple tip for everyone who's listening is just when you respond to positivity in your life, it just increases. When you respond to the negativity in your life, it just increases. And so trying to get someone to like you and defend yourself and control how they feel about you, it wastes and drains so much energy. And you could use all that energy for the people that love you. So are you just swiping up past the negative comments? I literally <clears throat> skip over negative comments. Genuinely, since day one, and I remember reading at the start, and so I'll, I'll add this. There have been times when I've looked at negative comments and been like, oh, that's quite funny. Like, you know, it's oh, they're yeah. funny, they're true. But overall, I try to respond to everyone who said something positive, and I rarely put any energy into put anyone who put anything negative because I don't want to change their mind. They're entitled to their belief. They're okay to feel that way. And if I feel like it's good feedback, I'll take it on board. But if I feel like it's just someone being a keyboard warrior and you know, doesn't like me and saying what they want, then I'm not gonna take that seriously. 
Yeah, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between the two. 100%. If there's some authenticity and truth behind it, it's a much different comment than just unabashed hate. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had everything from he has a wind machine in his videos to make sure his <laughs> hair flies, right? Like I've had that that angle. And I'm Wait, like, you don't have I a wind don't. machine? I don't. I just went out on a really windy day. <laughs> this is <laughs> an exclusive is, on the podcast. <laughs> this is an exclusive <laughs> on the podcast. I do not have a wind machine. Uh, but I've had everything from that. And I laughed at that. I thought that was a hilarious comment. Through to the other side of just like, you know, I don't agree with you and I don't agree with the point you're making. This is my point. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I had three minutes to explain that and I missed that point. Like, you're right. You know, I agree with you. If I, if I had a podcast like this, I could have explained myself. So, you know, I, but I do think that we do drag our own selves down. We put all the energy into the negativity and amplify it. Now, when you're leaving an opportunity, like working at a bank or working at a tech firm to become a monk, obviously your family is also going to be concerned about yeah. your well-being, your success, all Massively. of that. How did you deal with your family? Not saying they're toxic, but that doubt, because I know a lot of our listeners are not happy where they are. Mm. And I've gone through that myself and starting the show 12 years ago when everyone said you can't leave graduate school and it's a very difficult decision. And I don't even know that I have tips for it. I just did it. <laughs> Looking back, it's like maybe I shouldn't have done that. But how do you deal with it when the doubt is coming from the people that you really love and you know they care about you? Yeah, it was hard. I didn't go to my graduate. I graduated but never went to my graduation ceremony. So my mom doesn't have a picture of me holding my degree and that was a big thing for her yeah. because I moved to India I just went so I never went to that and that was a big thing for her and actually my parents I'm very grateful my mom and dad are actually fairly liberal and supportive of anything I've decided to do it's my extended family that's had more opinions yeah. and been more involved in kind of stirring stuff up with my parents if that makes sense so the way I dealt with it was always asking myself these questions around you know is someone invested in my future is someone going to be there for me when I'm struggling? And is someone paying my bills? Like those are my three checking system of who matters in life, like your soul, your mind and your paycheck. And I think the biggest thing I asked myself was just, am I going to look back on, if I don't do this, am I going to look back, going back to the Alexander the Great story, am I going to look back on my deathbed and say, my mom and dad held me back? Because I may say I'm going to do it for them. I'm not going to do this decision because I respect them and love them. But am I going to hate them in the end or be bitter towards them or feel a negative feeling towards them because I feel they held me back? And if that's the truth, I never want to feel that about my parents. They're incredible. So I need to go and take the responsibility to make this shift. And I think the truth is that when we think people are holding us back, it's just us not taking responsibility for us to push forward. Like that's all it is. Because the truth is, if you really, 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 really want something, right? Like if someone told you right now, you had to get on a plane and there was a million dollars in New York, no one would say, oh, my parents can't afford a plane. Like no one would say that. You would, no. you would do it. If you really wanted it, you'd get on a plane right now and you'd go pick that million dollars up. So it's our own insecurity that we reflect onto the people around us. And I think it's really important. I, I get it. There are people who are toxic around us. I get it. I had that too. There were people who were just like, Literally, people said to me, like, you realize you're going to fail at being a monk. You realize when you come back, no one's going to hire you. You realize when you come back, no one's going to want to be with you. You realize, you know, there were so many things Like people like, you know, you're going to be socially dead. Like no one's going to care where you are. There was so much of that, but it didn't get amplified because I was strong in my conviction. So the way I dealt with it was just keep strengthening your conviction rather than trying to weaken the argument. Because the, the, the opinions of others will get weakened when you strengthen your own, right? That's how it works. You don't weaken someone else's to strengthen your own. Right. And I, I love that. And, and we're, we're so sensitive to these things that, I mean, the, your, your best course of action is to strengthen yourself. And I, I even know for myself personally that, well, AJ and I talk about this all the time of, how well we have walled ourselves off of a lot of um, negative talk, toxic people. And <clears throat> it had been a while since I had any interactions with, with uh, that just wasn't positive. And I, and I, and I guy had uh, of, of a friend of a friend that I was having dinner with started poking around about the podcast and what I do. And for whatever reason, just took a couple shots at me. Never met the guy before, and it was, we had this conversation, it was so bizarre. 
But the one thing that I noticed was there was a day and a half that I reflected on this stupid conversation. Now, and I don't know where, why he said what he said or his intent, but what I do know was that for a day and a half, I had spent time reflecting on that, trying to figure out, well, what did that mean? And what's going on there? And that was a day and a half and too much time already gone, which I did not need to waste on that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we all do, right? Like that one, and thank you for sharing that. That one and a half days could have been invested in and, in anything. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. And Great story. When we talk about family, obviously it's, it's difficult for some of us because we want to succeed for them. We know all the sacrifice they made, but I think the one thing that gets lost in this is unconditional love, even if you fail. So you're listening to the show and your family is doubting you and saying, you can't do this. What is wrong with you? You can't be a monk. You can't create online videos. You can't start a podcast. I'm telling you that if you fail, those doors are open. 100%. They are never closed on you. The only thing that's going to hold you back long term is that regret of not trying and failing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're 100% right. And, and that's the thing that when I came back, literally my family was like, so there's some people that said, oh, we told you, sir. Like when I came back from being a monk three years after, a lot of people were like, oh, we, look, we told you. And the second thing I heard was like, why are you back so early? Like, you know, like we thought you were going to do this for real. And, and that's, it felt like a failure because I wanted to do it for a much longer time and I couldn't. So it felt like a failure in so many regards. And then I had to refigure my life out. But you're totally right that the people that genuinely love you will always stand by you, like always. And that's the best thing. It's such a great test. It's such a great test. Why do you want people around you that only love you when you do what they want you to do? Like, why do any of us want that? Like, why don't we just want people around us who genuinely stick with us through whatever we go through? Yeah, we uh, give away all of our power when mm -hmm. we allow that to happen. Now, obviously, putting out content like you put out, there is a concern, and I'm, I'm sure a number of our listeners, we talk a lot about perfectionism, right? You want the video to be perfect, and you want to have <laughs> this massive impact, and some of your videos have had ginormous impact, and then some, not as much. How much thought and uh, concern goes into launching that video and getting the traction that you're looking for, and are there moments of self-doubt, even today, sitting where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. I always talk about there's two types of create. Well, there's three types of creators, but we usually end up one or the two. So there's the sellout creator. A sellout creator only goes with what the audience wants. So you literally forget about anything you care about or believe in. You just go for what you think is going to get likes. And then the opposite is the selfish creator who only creates for themselves. They're like, I think this is amazing. Like <laughs> I'm the funniest person in the world or I'm the deepest person or whatever it is. And you create something and like no one wants to watch it because you literally made it for you and your mom. Like, you know, it's kind of like sits there. And so I always aim for being in the middle. I recognize that I want to stand for what I believe in, but I also want it to connect and resonate and have a positive impact on other people's lives. So that's my starting point, that every piece of content should be true to me but it should resonate with people. It should make a difference. I set a goal very early on that my videos were only 75% complete. And I say this everywhere. Actually, I've never said it often on, I've never said it on a podcast, but I've said it often in, on stage and at events. My videos are only 75% complete, which means I mess words up often. So you'll see that sometimes my sentence wasn't perfect. I mispronounced a word. I developed a lisp on a word because it was in flow and I said it and it wasn't right, but it felt right. And other things where I finished a shoot and we forgot a shot that was huge for the video, but I'm like, it's all right, 75%. So my goal with every video is 75%. And I've had to do that because I've realized that if I wait for 75 to 99, I'll be waiting for a year oh. and a half or three years. You'd have two videos. <laughs> yeah, I'd have two videos, right? And we release three videos a week right now. And so for me, the goal was always 75%. And I personally I love think, that. Yeah, and I personally think that's a great aim because 75% yeah. is realistic, it's quality. So you're not settling for less, but 75 to 99 is such a long journey. Well, we've, I, I'm sure all of us know people who want to be doing a lot of things and certainly things that we're doing and who for whatever, I need to read this next book or I, I need to write out this script and I, it's, gotta, it's not perfect yet. 
And I, and I also work in music where I've just been in the room with somebody who just wants to twist knobs on mixing a song for months. It's like, just finish it. Just put it out there. Allow the other component to the, the critic or the, the enjoyment of somebody else. And how many people do you think who are those types of people by you asking, uh, is it 75% that, oh yeah, it's 70. Absolutely. Okay. Then put it out. No, no way. No way. <laughs> yeah. It's still a hindrance, but I, if you can live with that, that's, that's great. I love that. Yeah. Well, now, yeah. I, I want to humanize you a bit. I want to okay. talk about that self doubt because yeah, you, you talk about aiming for the middle, right? You're not being a selfish creator. You're not just being a sellout. How do you deal with that energy and excitement you have for this video and it doesn't hit? It doesn't <laughs> yeah. get the traction. Oh, that, that you has think happened it so many times. That has happened so many times when a video you think is going to hit and it doesn't. And then there's a video you're like, that's never going to hit. And it does. And that's where I've reconciled my self doubt is recognizing that I don't always know what's going to work. And that's a beautiful thing. And that I've been, and, I, and I've been feeling this often that. I've got to where I want in life, just not in the way I imagined it. And that's the beauty of giving up that control and feeling slightly liberated. So I'll give an example of what I mean by that. I'm always working strategically, effectively, and impactfully in the best ways I can. But sometimes the place where I put my most energy does the worst. And sometimes something that I tried on the side like blows up and it's incredible. And that's where I've reconciled myself down, recognizing if I'm putting my best foot forward, and I'm working strategically and effectively, the things that are going to work will work. And it may not be the things I expect. And what we're doing is, or what I do sometimes too, is you're so focused on wanting one thing to work, you miss the fact that there's like nine other things that are happening that are amazing around you that you could never have dreamed of. And I've seen that in my life countless times where I wanted one thing to work, <laughs> three things were working over here, but I was so like, why is this not working? Like, why is this not working that you miss that? So self-doubt for me is something that I've tried to build a close relationship with and I get it all the time. I still get it before a post, before a video, before anything. I mean, I was just in, you know, I'm working on my book right now. I just launched a podcast and before I launched the podcast, I had no idea how well it was going to do, how badly it was going to do or anything. And there was a part of me that was like, are people going to listen to this? Like, are people going to care? Like I ask myself all those questions still today. Number one, I'm glad I asked myself those questions. It means I'm human. It means that I care. It means that it's important to me. I speak at so many conferences and everyone always asks me, do you still get nervous? I go, yes, I get nervous because I care. The day I stop feeling nervous, that means I don't care anymore. If I don't care anymore, that means I don't love what I do anymore. So for me, the first thing is I recognize that self-doubt just shows me that I care and that something's important to me. Whereas I don't doubt myself around things that I don't care about. Like if you asked me a question right now about what's the recipe for this amazing dish, I wouldn't know and I'd say, I don't know. And I'd be okay with it because I don't care about cooking. I'm not a cook, right? But if it's something that you care about, you will, you'll have self-doubt. The second thing that I do with self-doubt is I go, okay, if that's the things that I'm doubting myself for, what strategies, what can I put into place to overcome them? Doubt is just a great way of making you check what you need to work on. So if my doubt is, oh my God, not enough people are gonna to listen to this. So I'm like, okay, so how do we make it more listenable? How do we make the content better? How do we make the conversation better? If my doubt is, um, you know, I don't feel like people are gonna like this topic. Okay, what themes am I good at talking about? What is, you know, it's, it's a great checking system to improve what you have. So don't look at self-doubt as negative. Turn it into a positive by actually asking yourself those questions. Right, so build a relationship with self-doubt because it's never going to go away. Right, don't no. avoid it. Don't avoid That's it. The worst Definitely thing. don't avoid it. It's never going to go away. So if it's never going to go away, build a happy, positive relationship with it. So my positive relationship with it is you're showing me what I need to focus on to feel less of that. And most of us feel self-doubt because we're not researching, we're not building knowledge, we're not building expertise. And I think that's the biggest thing for me is when I feel self-doubt, it's because I don't, I'll, I'll give a perfect example. When I was thinking about doing a podcast and you're doing interviews, you don't just become an interviewer. You have to watch interviews. You have to absorb good interviewers. You've, you can't just be an interviewee. You have to watch good interviewees. And so for me, a lot of us start something and we feel self-doubt because we've never learned that skill. 
or we've never observed that skill. So my focus is if I want to be a good interviewer, I need to watch good interviewers. If you want to be a good stage performer, watch good stage performers. If you want to be a good monk, watch good monks, right? You don't become something good without seeing it. So self-doubt comes because you haven't upskilled. And the great thing today is you can do an online course. You can upskill from here. You can upskill from there. You can just listen to this podcast and watch you guys who've done it for such a long period of time. That's a, seeing someone who's done something consistently, that's the best way of getting good at something. And then your self-doubt will disappear. So self-doubt can only be cut by the sword of knowledge. It can only be cut by the sword of upskilling. So that's where it starts. I love that. Yeah, I, it was so eloquent too, on top of everything else. I feel like when we're struggling with that self-doubt, seeing it as a signal of like, push forward, don't, yeah. don't back away, it's so powerful. You had a survey on Instagram that I found fascinating and it asked your audience, do people know the real you? And half answered yes. How sad is that to you that only half answered yes? Do you know what? The truth is I'm not surprised. I feel like we've lived in a world that's constantly tried to get us to fit in. Like we were always told to fit in, stand in line. And then when you grow up, everything's like, oh, how do you stand out? And how do you, it makes no <laughs> sense, like, right? Like when I, I remember going to school and everyone's just like, stand in line, right? Fit in, like wear the same uniform. And then when you grow up, it's like personal branding, stand out, be yourself. And it's like, okay. So I'm not surprised that people don't know the real them because I think people are scared of being themselves because that may turn people off. Everything comes with connotations. We've been taught to be a certain way of what's normal and acceptable. All of those things. I remember the first time I wore robes on a street, right? It was like so scary. I was like, what if someone who knows me sees me? Like, I'm gonna feel weird. And, I, and then you think about it and you're like, why? Like, you know, why do we think that? Because we've been, you know, all these conditionings have been placed. So, for me, the big, th I'm not surprised by that is my first point. I don't feel surprised by it. And to those who answered no, what's your advice to them to, to allow people to see the real you, to be more authentic? I think the first thing is you've got to get comfortable being you. See, no one will ever be comfortable with you being you if you're not comfortable being you. And I think we first try and prove ourselves to other people. So my favorite, this is like, I talk about this all the time. It's, it's probably one of my favorite pieces of insights. It's from a writer named Cooley in the 1900s. And he said, today, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So what he means by that is, we are living in a perception of a perception of ourselves. If I think you guys think that I'm nice, then I feel nice. If I think that you think I'm weird, I feel weird. So we're constantly living through the perception of a perception of someone else. So my first thing is get away from that. Take that away, figure out how you feel about yourself. So I would say happiness is how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself, right? Like how do you feel about yourself when you're by yourself, when no one else is around? I and think start there. The, when you mention that, <clears throat> of yeah. these perceptions, the first thing I, I was thinking is how exhausting, yeah. right? To, to, <laughs> to want to know where, what, I'm, what you're thinking, of, then what you're thinking of me, and then now I'm going to, home that just sounds like an exhaustive <laughs> well, we, day and, and we've been friends for 12 years wow. you know mm -hmm. these thoughts never cross our mind it doesn't happen around friends yes. right when we're around the people that we have a relationship with already we're not constantly second guessing ourselves and feeling inauthentic mm. but when we're around strangers and we're mm. trying to impress them instantly all of that self-doubt creeps in and all of a sudden we put up this facade so one of the easiest ways for me to fake it until I make it as I'm working through this process of trying to get more comfortable as an introvert, meeting more people and having to put myself out there is treat people like they're already your friend, mm -hmm. wow, right? Nice. Assume like that, that they already like you, start there that we're already friends and then you don't have this inauthenticity that you're struggling with. I really like that. That's such a great tip. I love that. Yeah, and, and, and I think the other one is like just get comfortable being you and figure out what that means. Like if you just observe, when do you feel uncomfortable? So I found this, when I go to an event that I'm not speaking at, that is not about what I do, but I'm attending, I've observed that I prefer finding a one-to-one -one conversation in a corner and going really deep with someone rather than trying to mill around the like popular circles and try and have and direct a conversation. It doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. So now I can be myself by going, it's okay if I don't network at this event, 
If no one knows that I'm here, it's fine. I'm going to go off and have a meaningful conversation with one or two people. And when you know that, you just oh, put the great. pressure of yourself. And you're just like, yeah, like, I, I can't be, you know. And then, and then you can be, so it's just observing when you feel at your best. And then figure out how to do that in each place. And that's going to take testing and time. Like you're going to go to a party, you're going to do something that's not you. And then you're going to go, okay, I'm not going to do that again. And we've all been in that position. But you got to do it once. You've right? got to do it once. You have to do it once. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now let's talk about finding that elusive purpose. I know it's a big core of, of your message. And I know when we talk about figuring out who you are, right? Get comfortable with who you are. A lot of us are nervous thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And one of the exercises in our, in our boot camp is, is ask, what are your values? Who are you? And, and a lot of times, because we've had all this outside influence, marketing, everyone telling us what we should do, who we should be, we lose sight of what it actually is to be us. Mm -hmm. And in terms of finding your purpose, that seems like it's the first step is getting comfortable with yourself, understanding that. How do we take that next step towards finding that purpose? Yeah. So for me, I, I define it as your passion is for you, your purpose is for others. So your purpose is when you use your passion to serve others. That's the, the, the link. So for me, the focus actually first becomes what's your passion? Like, what are you passionate about? What do you enjoy doing? And then the, miss, the parts that, that's usually missed, so everyone here is follow your passion, find your passion. It's like a cliche, it's everywhere. The difference is get really good at it. Like get so good at it. And everyone always misses that point. You can be as passionate as you want about tennis. But if you're not really good at tennis, no one's going to care and no one's going to take note. And I think that's often missed that not only do you need to find what you're passionate about, you need to turn it into an expertise, which is undeniable. And that requires the hard work. That requires the work ethic. That requires the early mornings. That requires the training in whatever field you want to be. And then, and that's going to make you successful. So when you figure out your passion and you get really good at it, you're going to become successful but you're only gonna be happy when you use that success to help other people. And then you've gotta figure out that link to purpose. So you're gonna find your purpose. So when you realize, hey, I'm really good at this, I love it, I get a lot of happiness from doing it. When you start using that to make a difference in other people's lives in any way, it automatically switches into a purpose. So you don't need to find your purpose, it's just an automatic evolution of finding your passion and being really good at it. And that's where we're messing up, that we haven't found something we love and we haven't found something that we love that we've got really good at. So what we usually do with our lives is we do things that we're not good at and don't love, right? Or we do things that we're good at, but don't love. And we need to switch into the spaces of things that we love, but are not good at and get really good at them and start finding out things that you are good at and you do love. And so I would encourage you that any interest you have, like just go and Ex we just live in a world where you can explore anything and it's I was, great. yeah, anyway, so yeah, I, I want, we can dive into more of it. Yeah, well, let's talk yeah. about that, that mentorship for you and that process of getting really good at it. What did that look like for you? Okay, now you know I'm passionate about storytelling. Yeah. How did you get to the success around storytelling? Sure, so my parents did the best thing ever when I was 14. I was really shy. I didn't enjoy stages. I didn't enjoy speaking. My parents forced me to go to public speaking and drama school. So I spent 14 to 18 in public speaking and drama school. Changed my life. I did not know what I wanted to speak about. So even when I finished at 18, I still didn't like going on stage because I didn't have anything to talk about. So now you've got the tools, but you haven't got the passion. So I developed somewhat of an expertise in four years, but I didn't have what I was passionate about. And when I became a monk, I was like, this is it. This is why I went to public speaking school because I love talking about philosophy. I love talking about science. I love talking about culture. I love talking about life. I love talking about growth, etc. the mind. So I got what I was passionate about when I became a monk. So for me, the process came from four years of consistent public speaking school. Like it changed my life. And, and that's all thanks to my parents for forcing me to go. I had no interest in being a public speaker or a storyteller or any of these things. That was just, I lucked out. And then it was me finding what I was passionate to speak about. And then I've spoken, I've spoken for three hours a day for the last 13 years. And I spoke to audiences of zero, all the way to audiences now of thousands. But when I first started speaking, I remember I was invited to speak at a university where I wasn't getting paid for it. I was like 20 years old. I was invited to speak to this university. No one showed up, twice. So they organized two wow. events for me. I was meant to speak about life, philosophy, etc., all the kind of stuff I speak about now and zero people turned up. And I practiced my speech both times to an empty room as if it was a packed room because I was like, I'm still gonna practice. 
And so for me, having done this for three hours a day for the last 13 years, that's now being gratefully received online. So I'm very fortunate that it's shifted from an offline world to an online world, which we can dive into. Yeah. But the point is, it's, it's been my absorption and addiction for like, for, for over a decade now. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, for myself, I like traveling because I get to detach myself from the expectations and the influence of friends and social media. You're just in a new place by yourself and you're going to do the things that you want to do with no, no force in any direction. Um, you having an opportunity to go through what it's going to take to be a monk, to go off, to be detached from everything. Um, to be able to find out what those passions are for, for the folks who are listening to this, who want to investigate, uh, who they are, what those passions are, who are unable to go off to a monastery or to have the, 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 the time to dedicate to something like that, uh, seeing how well-rounded with all these things you are, uh, what do you have to suggest to the, to the folks listening out there? Yeah, absolutely. Great, great question. Thank you so much. I, I think we always have been trained to focus on the results. So people ask, what do you want in life? And I'm like, forget that. That's the worst question to ask someone. Because when you ask what you want, that's when the ads come in. And you're like, oh, I want that car. I want that home. I want that dress. I want that body. I want whatever it is. I, my question to is, what do you want to wake up and be every day? Like, what do you want to wake up and do every day? What's the process that yeah. you're in love with? So we're thinking about the result, whereas my question is, forget the result. What's the process that you're in love with doing? So start there, first of all. Don't start your journey of saying, I want to be a movie director because I want to, you know, I want to hit the blockbuster chart. So I want to do this. Don't make it about that. Like, don't, don't be like, I want to be a singer because I want to be Ariana Grande, right? Like, that's not the point. That's just a result. Do you love singing every day? And I realized this with a very honest question to myself. I'm really passionate about football. Soccer. I absolutely love the game. I grew up on it. I'm still a huge fan. I missed out on it when I was a monk. I've been catching up ever since. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, any football game. I was just in London last week and I made sure I went. I didn't, couldn't see a game live, but I went and watched it at a, at a bar in London. And I love the energy. I'm so passionate about soccer. I don't have what it takes to be a soccer player. Yeah. Like, I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. <laughs> I wake up at 4 a.m. to meditate. When I was a monk, I wake up at six, uh, 5.30 a.m. now to meditate. I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. to go out on a raining pitch and play soccer. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be in the gym for four hours a day. I want to meditate for four hours a day, but I don't want to uh, play soccer for four hours a day and then be in the gym and train. I'm not envious of any athlete in the world because it takes a different type of mindset. So first thing is find the process. The way to find what you're passionate about is literally use your weekends and evenings to do a test on anything. The best way is go and do a course, test it out. Try doing it once. Go and shadow someone who does it, someone in your life that does it. If you want to be a podcaster, come and shadow you guys for a week, right? And see what that life's like. See what it actually looks like to research, to sit with a guest, to find new guests, to work it out. Like go and shadow someone who's already doing it and then try and do it for a day. Like try and do the schedule of someone you look up to for a day. Like if you can do that for a day and you loved it, then do it for one more day. And if you loved it, do it for another day. And that's going to trickle in. So that's a much smarter way to finding your passion rather than just sitting there and reflecting, which is cool, which is important. But I'd encourage you to just get out there, right? Get out there and live the life of someone who's doing it when they started. That's another point. Don't focus on what people are doing now. Focus on what they were doing when they started. So a lot of people ask me, they're like, Jay, how many videos do you make a week? I'm like, I make three videos a week, plus my podcast on top of that, plus Instagram. And they'll say, oh, wow, that's too much. And I was like, yeah, but when I started, I made right. one video a week, <laughs> right? Like you don't have to start at what I'm doing now. Like you, you <clears throat> start so that, you know, go back to that. Well, what's been so fascinating with all of the guests that we've had on and all of their accomplishments and successes is they all speak to the same thing, that the results don't last. The results, you have a positive rush, this was great, and then immediately they're like, okay, what's the next thing I can do? Yep. And when we focus on the results, it literally is chasing ghosts. Mm -hmm. Because every result that we think was gonna be that big win turns out to be just another step towards something else. Yes. And I feel that when we lose sight of time, right? when we started this company and we were trying to get these interviews together and get the podcast going and coaching, there were 
times where we'd pull all nighters and not even blink like mm. time flew by and we didn't even realize it. And then the next day we're like so amped to just do it again. That's where we're starting to uncover this passion that we're talking about. It's not when we're sitting at the clock, watching the minutes go down and go, okay, when can I get out of here? When can I go do this other thing? I think the other thing that's so interesting about this message that I really love is this idea of experimentation at any age, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of the advice online is like, oh, well, you're young, experiment. No, if you're old, experiment. Everyone should be experimenting. And you've seen these results in all of the content you've produced, that it's through experimentation that you've learned how to find that message, how to tweak things and how to grow. Mm -hmm. And when we're not experimenting, we're just standing still. Absolutely. And that's the biggest challenge, right? We're not experimenting enough. And so a lot of my friends will say, Jay, you always look like you've got something exciting going on in life. And I'm like, yeah, I do. But that's because like nine people told me that my other ideas sucked, <laughs> right? And so like I've, I get more wins because I get more failures. Because I'm failing so often. I'm trying so many things out so often that don't go right. And then everyone sees the one thing that goes right. And that's how it works. And that's the odds for anyone. That's not just me. Anyone who's doing what they love every day is trying a hundred different things and most of them are not working. But because they're playing the game of numbers, something's gotta work. Like that's how I live. I'm just like, if I try 10 things this year, one of them's gotta work. But if I try one thing this year, most likely it probably won't work. Right. And that's the biggest challenge. If we just up our experiments, <laughs> it, like, you're gonna you know, do something new for every weekend this year. I was just thinking of the Instagram uh, where it's just, here's everything that I failed at today. Here's everything that I'm gonna be failing at tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nothing just but another failure in the life of, and uh, it allow people to just like, wow, there's a lot of this going on. But yes. The, the more comfortable you get with that failure, the more you realize it's just blips. It's not <laughs> anything that anyone is talking about. Maybe that guy who's in your comment section is yeah. going to hold on to it, but you're not holding on to it. No. And, and everyone you love and respect and look up to, that's been their path. And I think that's what's given me so much. That's what's liberated me from it. Like Steve Jobs is one of my biggest role models in, in certain areas of his life. And... When I've read his autobiography, uh, his biography, sorry, by Walter Isaacson, it's like the guy has failed so many times. Yet all of us, like most of us, have a phone that's an iPhone or an Apple product in our home or whatever it is. It's like he's not worried about all those times that went wrong because it, he obviously won big in, in this area of his life. So my take's just everyone you look up to, whether it's an athlete, an entrepreneur, a coach, a CEO, whatever it is, they have messed up so many times. And just know that. So when you're messing up, you're on the path. Like you're on the same path, right? And, and I, yeah, I encourage people to share what they're failing at too, because it just helps. Now, to, to wrap on this cool concept of toxic relationships, we talked about identifying it, going off and doing it and, and seeing the naysayers for who they are. Right now, you're in a position of success. And when you are successful, more and more people want a piece of you, want to take that success and use it for their opportunity. How do you find that inner circle? You talked about, okay, I, I have people in my inner circle telling me those are nine bad ideas. Don't mess with them. How do they get in your <laughs> inner circle? Walk us through that process for you. What do you mean about how do who get in my inner circle? The, the people that you rely on to tell you, hey, that's a bad idea, right? You talked about, you surround yourself with people who said right. those nine ideas, we aren't going to spend too much time on that. How did those people walk into your life? How do you let them into your life to right. become that inner circle you could trust? Yeah, and that's hard. That's hard. I think... Something that happens is you have to surround yourself by peers in a space too who understand you and don't see you as competition. And that's really hard and it's like a fine line. I genuinely believe that collaboration wins always. So I, my whole approach to most things has always been, hey, I wanna collaborate with you. Whether I'm bigger on social media or smaller on social media, I'm just like, I just wanna work together because I think that's gonna win long term for all of us both not just in terms of success and numbers, but more in terms of, I wanna be friends with you. And so I reach out regularly to people that I admire in different ways. And I reach out to them and say, hey, I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to learn from you. I'd love to connect. I'd love to be a friend. Like not, I'd love to, for you to teach me how you do this. And if that comes naturally from that relationship, amazing. If it never evolves into that, I've just got a great friend who now gets me. So I try and make friends in two areas. One is in an area of people who understand my life because I feel the conversations you can have with someone who does exactly what you do are just so great because they already get you. 
right? And uh, someone that I had on my podcast lately, her name's Lily Singh, Superwoman. Uh, she's become a recent friend. She's been incredibly and is incredibly successful on social media. She's using her platform for doing amazing good in the world. And she was someone I reached out to because I was just like, hey, like you've been doing all of this for a while. You started on YouTube a lot longer than I did. And I would just love to connect from you and hear from you. And she's become an incredible friend. And we've just been sharing ideas and learning together. And it's like that relationship's awesome. And then at the same time, I'm trying to find people who are not in media. So I still have friendships with the monks back in India. And I just spent January in India for a month. I was meditating again for, for roughly about 21 days. And I have them in my life because they remind me of like the roots and they remind me of the truths that bring me back. So I kind of like both. I love people who totally get my space. And usually those are people I reach out to. And then I love having my roots down. So most of my inner circle now is from people I've reached out to or they become people who've been reaching out to me for a long, long time and have been consistently reaching out to me asking for nothing. So it's been people who've just really believed, really engaged, really supported. And I, I just sense energy intuitively too. Like I'll take a meeting with someone and decide in a, in a meeting whether I'm gonna speak to them again or not. And I just trust that because my intuitions, I've been trying to strengthen it over the years and it's, it rarely lets me down. So I kind of go with that a lot. And my, my encouragement to everyone listening is you have a powerful intuition. You're just covering it with your head. So just listen to how you feel when you're <laughs> with someone. Like listen to your heart, listen to your gut, listen to your instinct, because it's probably usually right. Don't let your head get in there and make stuff up. Right. That yeah. survival instinct is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a absolutely. lot of us don't trust it. Yeah. I love the duality of having obviously in your niche, the people who are also killing it. So you don't have to explain yourself and you can actually trade war stories. And a lot of times through collaboration, see angles that neither one of you would have seen on your own. But then also the duality of like, hey, I need to be grounded too. Like I need to keep the people in my life that we're not here for the success. We're not here to build this huge platform, but we're here to teach me those core truths that now I have to share with the world. Yeah, and it's beautiful when they cross over sometimes too. Like there are sometimes when I'm with a social media person who says something really useful for my roots. And there's someone times when I'm with roots and they say something else. And there's a great story actually about when the prime minister of India, Modi, he visited Facebook. And Mark Zuckerberg interviewed him at Facebook at the headquarters. And Mark Zuckerberg told a story. He said that when he was struggling with the direction of Facebook in 2009, he went up to his mentor to ask a question. Now, Mark Zuckerberg's mentor happened to be Steve Jobs. And so he went up to Steve Jobs and he said, Steve, I'm struggling with the direction of Facebook. What do I do? And at that time, you know, I mean, Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs. He could have said anything and mm -hmm. it would have made sense. But you know, he could have said, go and meet a venture capitalist. He could have said, go and meet an investor. He could have said, go and meet a tech company. He could have said, I'll tell you what to do. Instead, he said, I think you need to go to India and spend some time in an ashram, a monastery in India with monks. He goes, when you do that, you'll find the answer of what you want to do. And to me, that is exactly why the people that are most successful in this world are successful because they surround themselves with people who have differing beliefs. And MIT did a research study on this. They found that people who are more innovative and creative in an organization knew people who didn't know each other. So when you know people who all know each other, you end up with the same answer, the same belief and confirmation bias exists. Mm -hmm. And you just keep building that echo chamber. Whereas if you've got two people who don't agree and you get a checking system, then you can trust your gut and go with what you believe. So I think I try and move away from having people around me. And it's not just yes men or yes women. It's about... It's not just about that, it's about building a circle of people, like you said, that want different things for you and knowing what they want for you. So when I'm with my mom, all my mom cares about is my health, <laughs> right? My mom does not care how successful I am, how many videos happen, how many people I help, even that. And my mom will get over that. She's like, how's your health? Like, are you taking care of yourself? Are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? Like, that's my mom. And it's like, if I go and I measure everything most of that, that's wrong. But if I know that that's what my mom wants for me, that's beautiful. That's what I get from her. And she'll take care of that. And same, you know, everyone plays a different role in your life. Don't expect everyone to play the role you want and don't expect everyone to play the same role. Recognize that everyone's playing their role in your life and let them play it. That's what makes a good movie. If everyone played the same role in a movie, it'd be boring. Very boring. Yeah, right? so. Now having access to all of that great knowledge, thousands of years old, spending time just consuming it in the monastery, our fans are huge readers. 
Is there a book that really changed you that you wish more people read that you could uh, share with our audience? Yeah, great question. Uh, so there's a book that I love called The Journey Home. It's the story of a, a man who hitchhiked at the age of 19 from America and London across the world in search for the truth. And it's incredible because it shows that desire as a true seeker and it's got travel, it's got potential romance opportunity, it's got that sacrifice, it's got everything. And it's just, an, it's a true story, it's an autobiography. It's just a really incredible story of how someone can truly seek the truth and want to find themselves and what that takes and what that looks like. So that book is incredible. It's called The Journey Home by Radhanath Swami. It's an autobiography. It's incredible. I highly recommend it. And then the Bhagavad Gita is the book I studied as a monk. It's 5,000 years old. It's the story of a warrior uh, getting advice from a divine coach, getting insight into life. It's been, it's, it's a book that's like the classic of India. And today, most knowledge that I read seems like it stems from it. Like there's rarely a quote or an Instagram quote or a Tumblr quote that I find that wasn't influenced by the Bhagavad Gita. It's, it's not the easiest read, but it's incredible if you dive into it with someone who knows it well. The, the last question I have for you, we were talking about this before. I, I'm sure our audience is, is interested as well. Starting a podcast, what, what are your goals for this show? Obviously, you have these great videos where are you taking your podcast? Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, the podcast is called On Purpose. It's on absolutely every platform. And the reason why I opened up this medium in my life was I wanted to build depth with my audience. So I feel like videos give you scale in terms of you can touch a lot of people for like three, four minutes. But I love the community I have online. And I, and I really believe I've got this incredible community and I wanted to build depth. I wanted people to get to know me better. I wanted to get to know them better. And the thing that really brought it about was I wanted to create a show, a podcast that allowed friends that I knew and guests that I have to go beyond what people see them as. So to go beyond their profession and into their purpose. And so some of the guests so far have been everyone from my wife to Russell Brand, to Novak Djokovic, to Giselle, to Rob Deerdeck, uh, a ton of incredible other people on the podcast as well. Everyone's amazing. And I've got a mix of people that have been friends that are celebrities and athletes all the way through to clinical neuroscientists, all the way through to just, I'm going to interview my mom too. That's going to be a lot of fun. So right on. it's a mix of, of personal, but I want to push beyond what people see these professional icons as and move into purpose. Because I sat through watching too many interviews on mainstream media where you've got someone trying to go deep and you just wanna talk to them about numbers, results, and success. And I've noticed that there are a lot of people out there in the world who want to speak about purpose, passion, and meaning, just like we all have today. And I want people to see that side of these incredible minds. So for me, it's about building a community, it's about building a relationship with my audience and, and a greater audience too. And I'm so grateful that it's had so much love so far already. So yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining us. It's yeah. been a great conversation. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, it. loved meeting you guys today and uh, hopefully we'll get to do lots more together as yeah. well. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank Excellent. you.